Our own shadows disappear as the feet of thousands by tens of thousands pound the fallow land into new dust that rising like a marvelous pollen will be fertile. Even as the first woman, whispering imagination to the trees around her made for righteous fruit, from such deliberate defense of life as no other still will claim inferior to any other safety in the world. The whispers, too, they intimate to the inmost ear of every spirit now aroused, they carousing in ferocious affirmation of all peaceable and loving amplitude, sound a certainly unbounded heat from a baptismal smoke where, yes, there will be fire. And the babies cease alarm as mothers raising arms and heart high as the stars so far unseen, nevertheless hurl into the universe a moving force irreversible as light years traveling to the open eye. And who will join this standing up? And the ones who stood without sweet company, will sing and sing back into the mountains and, if necessary, even under the sea. We are the ones we have been waiting for. That was Lebohang Mashile a South African poet who beautifully recited a piece by Jamaican-American poet June Jordan. It is titled Poem for South African Women. Jordan wrote extensively on issues of gender and race and is noted for her use of black English as a way to teach others about black culture and to distinguish it as its own language. This particular poem was written to commemorate the 20,000 South African women who had a march at the Union Buildings in Pretoria on the 9th of August, 1956. This day is celebrated as National Women's Day in the country. The demonstration was against the introduction of apartheid pass laws that forced black women to carry passes and permits. The protest was also for the presentation of a petition to the then Prime Minister, J.G. Stradom. The turnout was one of the largest for its time, and part of what made it so significant and successful is expressed in the following quote. Many of the African women wore traditional dress. Others wore Congress colors, green, black, and gold. Indian women were clothed in white saris. Many women had babies on their backs, and some domestic workers brought their white employers' children along with them. Throughout the demonstration, the huge crowd displayed a discipline and dignity that was deeply impressive. Yet, the Prime Minister or any of his staff did not make an effort to see the women. Surpassing that incivility is the fact that these women proved that the stereotype of women as politically inept, immature and tied to the home was outdated and totally inaccurate. This introduces our probe into African feminism. African feminism is feminism innovated by African women attuned to the African continent. It has been suggested that African feminism became necessary partly due to white Western feminism's exclusion of the experiences of black women and continental African women. White Western feminism has a history of not taking into account the particular issues black women face at the intersection of both their blackness and womanhood. Currently, white feminism often classifies African women as women of color, which groups and thereby neglects the African woman's historical track and specific experience. Of course, Africa consists of 54 countries, each with their own culture. Most African feminist thought originates from Egypt, Nigeria, Tanzania, Ethiopia, Ghana, Kenya, 
Senegal, and South Africa. As African feminism seeks to address a variety of cultural issues, it manifests in various strains, and I will define them briefly. First, we have motherism. Motherism, as described by Catherine Obianuju Achalonu, comprises motherhood, nature, and nurture. A motherist is someone who is committed to the survival and maintenance of Mother Earth, and someone who embraces the human struggle. In her book, Motherism, the Afrocentric Alternative to Feminism, Achalonu clarifies that a motherist can be a woman or a man. It is not selective of sex, because at the core of motherism is partnership, cooperation, tolerance, love, understanding, and patience. Next, we have femalism. This is a theory developed by Professor Chioma Opara, wherein she describes the female body as a site of patriarchal abuse and violence. In the context of the African continent, it is the bearer of European colonialism and exploitation. She likens the female body to Mother Nature and draws parallels between African nations mutilated by wars, poverty and disease, and the battered female body. Next we have snail sense feminism. This theory is proposed by academic and poet Akachi Adimora Ezeigbo. Snail sense feminism encourages women to work slowly like a snake in her dealings with men in the tough patriarchal society. This implores women to learn what she calls survival strategies to overcome social impediments and hence live a good life. Interestingly, she has a lot to say about Nigeria's political landscape, especially the deviant behavior male politicians engage in. In a short satirical piece titled Brave Stab, she brings attention to the politician's peculiar obsession with sex. It reads, These men permanently stand for erection rather than election. The nation must call them to action. Sex scandal must cease. Next we have Stiwanism. It was conceptualized by Omolara Ogundipe Leslie. The Stiwa in Stiwanism stands for social transformation, including women in Africa. Ogundipe Leslie recognized that feminism was a contentious subject in African culture. A line from her publication reads, The word feminism itself seems to be a kind of red rag to the bull of African men, which is why Stiwanism presents itself as a pragmatic approach to addressing African women's oppression whose roots are admittedly convoluted. She asserts that the struggles African women endure are perpetuated because they have internalized the patriarchy and endorse the colonial and neocolonial structures that naturally place men on top. The next strain is Nego feminism, which is the feminism of negotiation. The Nego, as explained by Obioma Naimeka, stands for no ego, in that this strain of feminism recognizes the importance of negotiation and compromise in African culture when wanting to achieve social change. In her publication, Naimeka writes that African feminism works by knowing when, where, and how to detonate, meaning set off, and go around patriarchal landmines. The last strain is African womanism. Womanism is a social theory based on the history and everyday experiences of black women. It holds that femininity and culture share equal importance in a woman's life. Her culture is not an element of her femininity, but it is the lens through which her femininity is understood. In the case of a black woman, her blackness is not a component of her femininity. Rather, it is the lens through which she understands her femininity. African womanism has two conflicting descriptions. The first description by Dr. Naomi Nkiala, who is an African, states that womanism isn't part of African feminism, 
as it pertains to African women of the diaspora, that is African women outside Africa and not continental African women. The second descriptor is called Africana womanism, which was coined by Clenora Hudson Weems, who is an African American, who defined Africana as being inclusive of women on the African continent and women in the African diaspora. She calls for a complete separation from white feminism, a movement which she states was created by and for white women without any incorporation of the African experience. It brings to question how much she knows about the African experience as an African American. It's also important to note that Hudson Weems was inspired by Sojourner Truth and her Ain't I a Woman speech. Now that we are familiar with the isms under African feminism, let's get to know our first poet, Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Hi, Sheila. Stella Nyanzi has a reputation on social media of being a free-spirited PhD holder who doesn't care much about the conventional roles expected of women in Uganda's conservative society. She's a medical anthropologist who studied in the University of London. Nyanzi says her character was shaped by her mum. Our mother raised us to be strong and reliant, uh, self-reliant really. Uh, we relied on our little circle of five. Mummy, Stella, Susan, Barbara who is also called Sison and Sheila. The yes rhymes with hiss. We hiss like snakes. Our mother, the Bible says, eh? be wise. As an academic, she studied youth sexuality, which partly explains her rather bizarre comments. It took undressing for them to say, by the way, where's Nyanzi's file? Every person that I have written to that was silent, hmm? I'd write, I'd write, I'd write, and then I became the criminal. I was criminalized for appealing for help. On Monday morning, the dispute between her and the executive director of the Makerere Institute of Social Research, Professor Mahmoud Mamdani, over a new PhD program left many in shock when she undressed and uttered swear words. People ask what I smoke. I smoke inquiry. You know, I smoke questioning. I smoke pondering. I smoke thinking and thought and philosophizing. A refusal to teach in a PhD that was Dr. Stella Nyanzi, who made her dissatisfaction known by protesting in the nude. I appreciate her comment towards the end. She took a question that was meant to demean her, that is, what do you smoke? And she owned it, turning it on its head, answering that she smokes questioning, thought, and philosophizing. If it's not obvious, she's quite the personality and she channels her audacious character in her writing. I am reading to you, Women Shall No Longer Wait, by Dr. Stella Nyanzi. Women shall no longer wait for absent men to drive these poisonous snakes out of houses. We pick up your machetes, rusting away, and chop the venomous snakes into many pieces. Women shall no longer wait for castrated men to carry the coffins of kin killed by the state. We wear your trousers and your kanzus and lift the caskets to the graves dug by ourselves. Women shall no longer wait for timid men to fight for the liberation of Uganda. We pack missiles in our own pens and grenades in our mouths and shoot our truths at the dictatorship. Women shall no longer wait for blinded men to drive us to the beautiful promised land. We thicken the muscles of our legs and ride ourselves to freedom on bicycles and cars. Women shall no longer wait for faceless men to woo, love or pleasure us. We wear dildos dipped in oil and inseminate ourselves with the strongest sperm. Need I say any more? This poem is a captivating expression 
of independence, delineating the many ways in which women can take up what are deemed to be mantles of masculinity. The mantles described in the poem are bravery, in that women shall take it upon themselves to defend themselves from harm. They shall have the backbone, wear the trousers and attend to injustices done by the state. They will be the ones to fight for liberation, to take themselves to the promised land, and in what I think is the greatest claim of independence, they will rely on themselves for their own pleasure. Truly, a powerful way to end the poem. Everything before the last stanza is for the good of society, protection, liberation, and tending to injustice, whereas love and pleasure are so distinctive, and the speaker proclaims that with the same will and strength, women shall find it within themselves to fulfill that distinctive need, deeming men null and void, right? Or at least the absent, castrated, timid, blinded, and faceless men. Ironically, all these types of men that women shall no longer wait for bear traits that are somewhat associated with femininity being timid, castrated in a figurative sense, blinded, i.e. submissive, and faceless, which could mean not having an identity separate from a man. But I think that's a reach. Could we then surmise that women shall no longer wait for emasculated men? Or, or that the men in Yanzi's context are all emasculated and so women must realize their potential. There's lots we can derive from this, especially if we consider African family dynamics and the subject of single mothers. Our next poet is Ijioma Umebino. She is a Nigerian writer who challenges the culture of silence in her homeland. This culture of silence permits the abuse of women and victim blaming. These are topics she addresses fervently. She writes short pieces, so I'll read a couple. They don't have titles, by the way. The first reads, I did not know the bodies of women were meant to be a museum of tragedies, as if we were meant to carry the ocean without drowning. Before I talk about this, I want to warn that I will be talking about sexual assault, so please use the timestamps if you do not feel comfortable listening to this section. I think the Museum of Tragedies coincides with the alarming rates of child sexual assault. It is definitely a widespread issue. In Nigeria, almost 3 in 10 adults know someone who was sexually assaulted in their childhood. In South Africa, it is estimated that over 40% of women will be victims of sexual assault in their lifetime, and that only 1 in 9 of those assaults are reported. Victims go on with their lives laden with this tragedy, and because of the culture of silence, they are vulnerable to reoffense and mental harm, and their bodies exhibit the order of tragedy like a museum. Rarely is it one tragedy, instead, it is one tragedy that introduces a host of others, which is why I think the word museum emphasizes that these tragedies don't exist in isolation. The next poem reads, I am woman enough to know you do not force womanhood out of girls, that you do not shame the bodies of girls, forcing them to carry themselves like an apology, to hold sorry on their lips. This poem touches on the ways in which patriarchy impacts women and girls. Let's refer to the theory of snail sense feminism that encourages women to develop survival strategies to overcome social impediments so that they can live a, quote, good life. The survival strategy being criticized here is the expectation for young girls to assume a lowly perspective of themselves, insecure and ever apologetic, as a way for them to make their way through life with little opposition. In Umebino's words, this form of patriarchy works systematically 
to disempower girls and women as they are stuck in a cycle of insecurity and self-blaming. These two pieces are from her book, Questions for Ada. So that settles our exploration of African feminism. Let's get into the relationship between Islam and feminism, get to know some poets and thinkers, and have a go at some pieces relating to this relationship. It's the Arab world's version of American Idol, where, believe it or not, you become an instant star by reciting poetry. Man after man talking about soccer, life in the desert, and then a shock. In full niqab, a Saudi Arabian woman, Hessa Halal, knees knocking. I am a strong woman. I am brave. This is the first time I'm standing in front of all of these men. She knew in her country there would be scorn, death threats, and there were. After all, Saudi women can't drive, can't travel, go to college without permission of a male. But her husband said he would support her for their four young daughters, the youngest autistic and cannot speak at all. And so she recited her poem. I send you meaning like rain to defeat fear. And then addressing the punitive authorities, she said, do not fear his snake hiss. You have a waving wing when you fly. No one can reach you in the sky. After the shock, she says people came in droves to support her. What I'm seeing is a lot of courage out there. A lady, she's speaking out and she's in niqab. That's something amazing for me. As for the judges, they praised her courage, but only gave her third place. Though the prize is big, $800,000. Though in Saudi Arabia, her husband will decide how to spend it. No matter, she told us, for one moment, one woman in Saudi Arabia spoke the truth. I always tell myself, maybe Hissa, one day you will be like a message in a bottle. I mean, you reach to the other side of the sea and it happened. A voice from behind the veil heard around the world. And so we choose Hissa Halal and her message sent out to the world. I'm a woman, and for an extremist, there is no greater sin than a woman's embrace of literature and poetry. That is a quote by Saudi Arabian poet Issa Hilal, who is known for expressing her attitudes towards the Salafi way of life that has been taken to be the norm in her home of Saudi Arabia. The Salafia movement champions an early Sunni school of thought and is known as traditionalist theology. Salafis place great emphasis on practicing actions in accordance with the known Sunnah, which are the sayings and practices of the Prophet Muhammad. Some scholars and activists propose that the Quran be the only source for guiding the relations between the sexes, because other sources, such as the Hadith and Sunnah, are understandings of the Quran influenced by a hierarchical and patriarchal society and a great portion of the commentators in these sources were men. The poem I am about to read to you is titled The Chaos of Fatwas. A fatwa is a legal opinion or decree handed down by an Islamic religious leader. Hilal describes her feelings towards extremism and the division it reaps. I have seen evil from the eyes of the subversive fatwas in a time when what is lawful is confused with what is not lawful. When I unveil the truth, a monster appears from his hiding place, barbaric in thinking and action, angry and blind, wearing death as a dress and covering it with a belt. He speaks from an official powerful platform, terrorizing people and preying on everyone seeking peace. The voice of courage ran away, and the truth is cornered and silent, when self-interest prevented one from speaking the truth. As you heard in the clip at the start, Hilal's presence on a competition stage was quite the demonstration. 
she has remarked that following the dominance of traditional theology, of which the decree of fatwas is a component, there was a certain air of haughtiness in the attitudes of many observant Arab Muslims. Quote, Some men with beards and women in niqab started giving everybody the I'm better than you look. There is a Wikipedia page that lists an assortment of fatwas that have been decreed, some being opposed by other Muslim authorities because of their absurdity. I encourage you to go have a read at some of them. In a male-dominated competition, Hilal came forward and defended her opinion by saying that it is extremism that sees her and her talent for literature as being at odds with religion, rather than proper Islamic beliefs. So what do proper Islamic beliefs say about women? This leads me to read a passage from a publication titled Reconciling Islam with Feminism by Iman Hashim. Feminists have tended to regard religion as just another of the sources of women's subordination, citing the manner in which women are often represented as subordinated in religious texts and the frequency with which religion is used to justify and maintain men's dominant positions in society. Although these charges are levelled at all the major religions, Islam in particular has a reputation for being anti-woman and for supporting a segregated social system where men are economically and politically marginalised. Many Muslim women and men disagree with such a view arguing that the Qur'an provides significant rights for women, which are often far more wide-reaching than the rights which secular legal systems provide for a state's female citizens. However, many Muslims are frequently mistrustful of feminism because they see the feminist emphasis on equal rights as at odds with the Islamic notion of the complementarity of the sexes and the specific roles and rights laid down for men and women which they believe reflect their particular strengths and weaknesses. Some scholars identify two aspects of Quranic instruction, the socio-economic and the ethical religious categories. While women's status is inferior to men in the former category, socio-economic, they are full equals in the latter, ethical-religious. Muslim reformists argue that the difference between men and women in the socio-economic sphere belongs to the category of social relations, which are subject to change, whereas their moral and religious equality belongs to the category of religious duties towards God, which are immutable. The moral and religious equality of men and women represents the highest expression of the value of equality, and therefore constitutes the most important aspect of Islamic instruction, since men and women are full equals in creation, in mind and in their spiritual and moral obligation, there is no justification for inequalities between the sexes. So there is a lot to unpack there, and I probably won't do it all in this episode. But the main point I got is, despite it not aligning with secular feminist values, Islam shows no inequality towards the sexes, because men and women were made with complementary roles and are ultimately equal on a moral and spiritual basis, that is, in the eyes of God. And that is a similar response in other Abrahamic religions. Having said that, I think the secular feminist critique is, to what extent can a suppressive rule over women be justified as adhering to religious instruction? Something to contemplate. Now, when we think of Islamic feminism, there are considerations that it is paradoxical and oxymoronic. Still and all, Islamic feminism speaks on behalf of women who don't want to choose between secular or Western feminist emancipation and their belonging to Islam as a culture and religion. They position themselves as Muslim women who are not blind to or passive towards patriarchy, but instead they aim to produce an alternative to secular feminism. So in the same light of African feminism, Islamic feminism is feminism by Muslims attuned to Islam. One of the oldest thinkers associated with Islamic feminism is Jamil Sidki al-Zahawi. 
He was an Iraqi poet and philosopher. Al-Zahawi was a critical figure in the development of Arabic literary modernism and a scholarly and outspoken contributor to political and social debates during the early part of the 20th century. Al-Zahawi saw poetry as a revolutionary tool for communicating social critiques. He was a staunch advocate for women's rights, going so far as encouraging that they abandon the veil. With regards to this matter, he is quoted as saying, A veil does not protect a girl's chastity, but her education and science protects her. He was involved in the politics of the Ottoman Empire and was affiliated with the Young Turks. He was also a critic of the Wahhabis, which are the extremist group that founded the Saudi Kingdom, and he was an avid observer of the political currents in Europe. Al-Zahawi was a proud man, and at the same time, self-contemptuous. At the end of his life, he said about himself, In my childhood, I was thought of as eccentric because of my unusual gestures. In my youth, as feckless because of my ebullient nature, lack of seriousness and excessive playfulness. In my middle age, as courageous for my resistance to tyranny. And in my old age, as an apostate, because I propounded my philosophical views. The opinion that deemed him an apostate was his quote unquote faith in the theory of evolution, which is contrary to the views of the Arab community in his time. He also published a number of works on the subject of astronomy, including the universe, gravitation, and its explanation. These theories later turned out to have fundamental flaws. With regards to his style of writing, he made it a point to always be simple and to avoid the artifice and false conceits that traditional poets employed. He was the first Kurdish poet to use blank verse, which is free of rhyme. This is because he saw it better for a writer to focus on expressing ideas rather than preoccupying themselves with a rhyme scheme. Another of his advocacies was against the practice of older men marrying adolescent girls, as well as forced marriage without previous acquaintance polygamy, and male privileges. This is expressed in a poem titled Equality in Age. It reads, How many men of sixty have married adolescents, their grey hair burning as fire on their heads? For an unknown term, he does his work with her. And it might be short, that term and the tether of kindness afterward is his last concern, whether it stretches between them or not. She married without apprehending her future misery. Is her husband one of the ogres or a man? He curses her, not for a sin, then kicks her. She bears all his insults. And after that, he scurries off, as an ostrich wood to his friends, dry inside as dead wood. 4. Never enough to satisfy his insatiable hunger, while for a wolf one lamb satiates. Her family forced her to marry the rich, coveted old sheikh. In his house he has wives, three, but the sheikh wished four. She sleeps with him in the house, as he is old as her father. Tell us, how is the union made? In the house, she will live miserable or die depressed. Death by sorrow is better. In the house, sorrow, misery and despair will appear. To her as ghosts, she will receive disasters as guests. And she has wedded to the sheikh, giving as her gift her misery, a gift he greatly enjoyed. She begged him, please, sheikh, don't bring me your desire. You are my father, but even older. If your grey hair didn't deter me, your ignorance would. The sheikh refused to fetter his lust, unhappy to leave what he expected. 
he puffed angrily, angling his brow, and grabbed her as she pushed him away, telling her, Asma, you are mine by Sharia, and what Sharia makes mine shall obey. God in heaven made you mine. He is wise and prescribes the right and the wrong. When she saw there was no one to defend her, preserve her from the sheikh. When the sheikh began to tire, she lifted a cup prepared with poison and provoked, gulped it down. This is one of Al Zahawi's most celebrated works. It is immersive, provocative, and so insightful. The following lines telling her, Asma, you are mine by Sharia, and what Sharia makes mine shall obey. God in heaven made you mine. He is wise and prescribes the right and wrong. I think these lines summon the critique I mentioned earlier. To what extent can a suppressive rule over women be justified as merely adhering to religious instruction? I'm so captivated with the narration of this poem because it reveals the folly of child marriage and even arranged marriage. Considering the perspective of the woman was not usual, but the speaker includes it along with the sheikh's view, which paints a full picture. He thinks he is deserving of this fourth marriage. It is mandated by a divine law. But she, for all her adherence to this law, can see that it is not right. Quote, she begged him, Please, sheikh, don't bring me to your desire. You are my father, but older. Once again, this full view confirms the folly of this marriage. With regards to child marriage, it's still prevalent in 117 countries around the world. So there's still much to be done. Next, I'd like to talk about sartorial piety, a.k.a. pious fashion. I'm sure you are familiar with the various types of head coverings adorned by most Muslim women, the popular being the hijab. In the West, the hijab, more so the act of covering up in accordance with Islam, has been a subject of contention. Take the ban of burkinis on France's southern beaches in July and August of 2016 or that in 2006, there were 154 cases of discrimination or harassment in which a Muslim woman's head covering was identified as the factor that triggered the incident. According to the American Civil Liberties Union, Muslim women have been denied the right to wear a headscarf while working as police officers and in other occupations. They have also been fired for refusing to remove their headscarves. At schools, Muslim girls who wear headscarves or whose mothers wear headscarves have been harassed or assaulted. Students have also been denied the right to wear a hijab to school. One popular reason for this conflict is the notion that Islam is in conflict with Western values. That is an intricate subject on its own, but not a justification for discrimination. The following poem by a Muslim woman living in the West sounds off the frustrations women like her bear, being a woman of colour and adhering to a minority religion and culture. She also brings the hijab to our attention. As the wearer of one, she assures those against it that she is far from being oppressed by it. But you want to know who's really oppressing her? Well, that will follow in the poem. This is Ode to the West by Fatima Lezaik. I am a woman of colour, although my skin is as white as yours. I make my own decisions, and I'm sick of your terror wars. I am a woman who gets stared at daily. All eyes are always on me. I can't seem to walk freely in your country of liberty. I was raised to make my own decisions. No man tells me what to do. So listen, O oh West, I have some things to say to you. I am a woman of faith. Please tell me what is wrong with that. 
What's wrong with having something to believe in? Please tell me. Let's sit and have a chat. I am a woman of rich history and culture, a woman of the Arabian Nights and Mediterranean Sea. If you hate it here so badly, you say, then go back to your own country. Go back to your land, the one we keep invading, the one we peacefully visited to lend our friendly hand. Go back to your land, the one we drained of from oil, gold, and jewels. The one we bomb daily and make sure the world never sees the news. Go back to your country, the one we left completely broken, the one we came to set free. But instead, we left dead bodies as token. I can go on and on, but leave that for another day. Now I'm here because I'm sick of you judging me for dressing in a certain way. I am sick of your rumours and ugly misconceptions. I am sick of your disgusted stares. Yes, I can see it in your reflections. I am sick of you telling me how I should dress and how I should look. Oh wait, I'm confused. Aren't you the one that claims women are free? Oh dear West, excuse me for thinking this also applied to me. My body, my choice. Isn't that what you say? So why is it you get angry when I dress in a certain way? My body, my choice. Isn't that what people hear? So why is it when I choose to cover my body and my hair, you get uncomfortable and always stare? My body, my choice. Isn't that supposed to be true? So why do you keep banning my burkini and want me to strip down to look like you? Are you afraid because I am different? Is this what it's all about? Are you intimidated by my restraint? My decision to cover and keep my body to myself? Is this what it's all about? Are you afraid of what women could do if they can't be controlled by people like you? Are you that threatened by a woman who covers her hair? Are you so insecure, so afraid of what I wear? Is this why you keep spreading false information? Why you tell the world I am oppressed and need liberation? Is this why you're banning me from attending your universities? Are you afraid of what the world would do if they realize that the one oppressing me is you? Let me explain it to you, O oh West, in a language that you can understand. Hopefully, you won't be afraid any more and won't see my veil as a crime so grand. That piece of clothing on my head, it's called a hijab. It covers my hair, not my brain. It's part of who I am and has nothing to do with you. No one forced me to wear it. No one forced me to cover. My father treats me like a princess, and I am so spoiled by my brothers. Oh, and as for my husband, no, he doesn't treat me like a slave. He loves me so dearly, it encourages me to be strong and brave. He treats me like his equal and doesn't think of me as less. But guess what, O oh West? He doesn't ask to split the bill in two. I guess this is one of the many differences between me and you. I am a woman of colour, with hopes and dreams like you. A woman who struggles daily to get equal job opportunities. I am a woman of colour, who is also a proud woman of faith. I am a woman, a human being, who happens to be born in a different part of the world than you. So can you try, O oh West, for just a moment, to switch places between me and you? Can you try to understand where I come from? Try to walk a day in my shoes? Would you be okay with people looking down on you, like the way you look down on me? Would you be okay with people calling you names? always staring at you as you pass by? Would you be okay with being labelled? And if you're not, then tell me why. Why do you do it? Why do you think you should have a say in what I should wear? Why do you think I should even care? Why do you keep limiting my freedom? Why do you keep harassing me? Why can't you just let me be? If you haven't changed your mind after all that's been said, still intimidated and disgusted of what I wear on my head, if you still think I am a victim, still think I am oppressed, then you should know, O oh West, that yes, I am oppressed, and yes, it's all true, 
but the one oppressing me is not them. It's you. What a way to end. The speaker's frustration is very perceptible. I do feel that at certain points of the poem, her protest is repetitive. She kind of loses her rhythm and rhyme scheme, and she could have used different and more illustrative words. That being said, this is a very passionate rebuttal against the idea that the hijab and even the notions within Islam are oppressive towards women. A good example of Islamic feminism, as we defined it before. I want to move on to discuss the relationship between the sexes, mainly in the Arab world, which have been heavily influenced by Islam. I will begin with this quote by Nizar Kabani, who is the poet for this discussion. Love in the Arab world is like a prisoner, and I want to set it free. I want to free the Arab soul, sense, and body with my poetry. The relationships between men and women in our society are not healthy. Nizar Kabani was born in Damascus in 1923. His father was a businessman and Syrian nationalist who was frequently arrested because of his anti-French activities. Kabani took after his father in that he was very political. In 1954, one of his most famous poems, titled Bread, Ashish and the Moon, was a scathing attack on backwardsness in the Arab world. He wrote about the lack of human rights, the abundant corruption, and the low status of women in Arab society. The poem was so controversial that it was debated in the Syrian parliament, with some delegators contending that legal action had to be taken against him. Despite him expressing much despair in his writing, Kabani's poetry is also romantic and elegant and accessible to the average reader. Here is a poem that is on the more romantic side of his writing. It is titled, Love Compared. It reads, I do not resemble your other lovers, my lady. Should another give you a cloud, I give you rain. Should he give you a lantern, I will give you the moon. Should he give you a branch, I will give you the trees. And if another gives you a ship, I shall give you the journey. That was a nice read. Now, let's talk about his advocacy for women's rights. Kabani wrote poetry with respectful reference to women and their point of view. When he was a teenager, his family tried to force his sister to marry someone she did not love. As a consequence, she took her own life, which may explain why Kabani became such a strong advocate for women's emancipation. The poem to follow is titled, I Have No Power and it has been suggested that the subject of the poem, who is a woman, was inspired by veteran actress Sophia Loren. She often starred in films as a sexually emancipated persona and was prominent around the time the poem was written. Alternatively, it could be argued that he was exploring the contradictions in his society. I'll leave you to decipher. Here is I Have No Power by Nizar Kabani. I have no power to change you or explain your ways. Never believe a man can change a woman. Those men are pretenders who think that they created woman from one of their ribs. Woman does not emerge from a man's ribs, not ever. It's he who emerges from her womb. Like a fish rising from depths of water and like streams that branch away from a river. It's he who circles the sun of her eyes and imagines he is fixed in place. I have no power to tame you or domesticate you or mitigate your first instincts. This task is impossible. I've tested my intelligence on you, also my dumbness. Nothing worked with you, neither guidance nor temptation. Stay primitive as you are. I have no power to break your habits. For thirty years you have been like this. For three hundred years, a storm trapping in a bottle. 
a body by nature, sensing the scent of a man, assaulted by nature, triumphs over it by nature. Never believe what a man says about himself, that he is the one who makes the poems and makes the children. It is the woman who writes the poems and the man who sings his name to them. It is the woman who bears the children and the man who signs at the maternity hospital that he is the father. I have no power to change your nature. My books are of no use to you, and my convictions do not convince you. Nor does my fatherly counsel do you any good. You are the queen of anarchy, of madness, of belonging to no one. Stay that way. You are the tree of femininity that grows in the dark, needs no sun or water. You, the sea princess who has loved all man and loved no one, slept with all men and slept with no one. You are the Bedouin woman who went with all the tribes and returned a virgin. Stay that way. Think back to the words of Moderata Fonte when she expressed that the priority in creation didn't matter, and if anything, it proved the superiority of women. For men were born out of the lifeless earth in order that women could be born out of living flesh. In a very inversive way, Kabani says, Those men are pretenders who think that they created woman from one of their ribs. Woman does not emerge from a man's rib, not ever. It's he who emerges from her womb, like a fish rising from depths of water, and like streams that branch away from a river. It's he who circles the sun of her eyes and imagines he is fixed in place. Both use religious allegories to make the point of women's superiority. While Fonte plays along with the creation story, Kabani debunks the creation story. Quote, Woman does not emerge from a man's rib, not ever. It's he who emerges from her womb. Which could pose a challenge against the gender hierarchy found in religion. He has made it clear that patriarchy is founded on these debatable ideas rather than being a divine and immutable order. In light of this, he says, I have no power to break your habits. I have no power to change your nature, though it has been taught to me that I do. And so he salutes the woman in her freedom as the queen of anarchy, of madness, of belonging to no one, the tree of femininity that grows in the dark that needs no rain or sun the sea princess who has loved all men and loved no one, who has slept with all men and slept with no one, the Bedouin woman who went with all the tribes and returned a virgin. That woman, whichever woman she is, ought to stay that way. And that concludes our inquest in Islamic feminism. We're just about to end, but I'd like to take a detour and talk about misogynistic poetry, because it has an interesting history. Misogynistic or anti-feminist tradition, as it's called, dates back to the 15th century. A notable and supposed contributor to this tradition was Geoffrey Chaucer, who is considered the father of English lit. Some hold the opinion that he was an early feminist, while promotion of sexual misconduct and assault can be picked from his work. He is considered to be an early feminist because of the characters in the Canterbury Tales, his best-known work. They are three pilgrims who are women, who are given voice, which wasn't the norm, and the female narrator was given more elaborate character traits than the male narrators. Conversely, the Miller's Tale and the Reaver's Tale unfortunately depict women as enjoying or easily recovering from said misconduct and assault. Countering his problematic tales was our girl Christine de Pizon. Isn't it nice to see how everything is just aligning? So before we get into our selected sonnet, let's get a bit more context. Writers of misogynistic satire would associate women with animals. 
The theological tradition, first espoused by early church fathers, contained teachings that claimed women to be closer to the body than men, as Adam was created in God's image, rendering men more spiritual, while Eve was created from Adam's rib, rendering women more bodily. This thought generated the idea that women were more sexual than men and were thus slandered as sexually insatiable to a beastly and even feral degree. I am reading you Like the She-Cats in January by an anonymous 15th century poet. Just like the she-cats in January go about fleeing with rage, so too goes my lady, every man should know, down upon the houses seeking respite. And if she can't find one who can fill her bushel, she goes about driving storms and such big lips, and fire seems to come out of her cage, until her large inkwell is satisfied. If, by disgrace, she can't find any pen that will give her its ink, she melts away like newly fallen snow. She quickly finds a way into such a wide street. She thrusts your pustule until it needs to shoot out. She'll remain atop you. So many innuendos, right? I'm reading you a very small section of an analysis done by Fabian Alfie. The opening quatrain sets the tone for the entire sonnet. In the third verse, the poet portrays the sonnet as a warning by men for other men, a typical strategy of misogynistic writers. The poet uses insulting and exaggerated language and indicates sexual organs and activities in remarkably blunt terms. Blunt language was a defining characteristic of satire in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. The term satire was etymologically derived from satyr, and since satyrs were nude, so too did satires use unadorned language. The linguistic simplicity of satires helped poets fulfill their roles in decrying unethical behaviours. It is difficult to discern any ethical intentions in the sonnet at first, as it seems to be little more than an ugly portrayal of a sexually aroused woman, but it derives its morality from the literary tradition of misogynistic satire, which is the attempt to dissuade men from love and sexual contact with women. In the insipid verse, the writer compares the woman to a cat in her heat, meaning when a cat is in high fertility or something like that. The author bases his insipid verse on the observation that cats typically mate late in the winter. Like cats in heat, he writes, the lady's lust has driven her mad. The comparison to the cat dehumanizes the woman, thus rendering her at the same level as an animal. The author of the sonnet, like many other misogynistic writers, represents her lust as debasing her human nature. Reinforcing the debasement, she is described as insane, devoid of any human reasoning. Women were commonly viewed as naturally more prone to lustfulness and less intellectually developed than men. The poet simply extends these commonplace ideas about women to their logical extreme. Something to really mull over, right? I'd say we've come a long way, but that's debatable and relative especially when we look at the 15th century in comparison to our first appearance some hundred thousand years ago. I'm sure if you've listened this far, you're probably opposed to the 15th century thinkers. But thank goodness their view isn't the consensus anymore. Let's wrap this up. The future of feminism. The future is female. You've most likely seen the latter phrase plastered across all kinds of surfaces. Alas, the future is no longer elusive to us. It seems like it's going to be female. The last poem I will read to you is by the youngest inaugural poet and National Youth Poet Laureate, Amanda Gorman. She recited this poem at Forbes Women's Summit in 2019. 
It is titled, The Way Forward. It reads, What is the way forward when women have met many roadblocks instead of roads? What is the way forward when on this path we've carried hefty burdens and heavy loads? In many ways, today at Forbes is to open up a door because we know we cannot afford to keep women away from the table. In many ways, today at Forbes is a declaration that women are light, orbs, beacons, a formidable force to be reckoned with, that we beckon to the front of the conversation. And though we are all here by invitation, we don't need an invitation to make change in our neighbourhoods, our cities, our nations, to reclaim our time to make the climb, to be the skinny poet at Forbes dropping rhymes. We're devoted to doers and doings, women and what they're pursuing, in all the speeches, panels and interviewing. There is a thunder of the movement that is brewing. We are not the sand simply taking in the water of the sea it absorbs. We are the shore, we are the storm, the very form of change. Women are that great foray towards what the world's been waiting for. You see, the way forward isn't a road we take. The way forward is a road women make, not just at Forbes, but for all. Forged forth by a future that is female. We will not be slowed. Come, the loads, roadblocks, hills that may. We'll keep fulfilling this path until the world goes still to say. Where there's will, there's a woman. And when there's women, there is always a way. Thank you for listening. I appreciate you giving your time. If this is your first listen, I hope this was impressionable enough for you to join me again for another episode. If you're returning, your loyalty is unmatched and received with much gratitude. As always, my email is open for any further discussion on a topic, episode suggestions and even submissions. What poem resonated with you in this episode? Which thinker do you agree or disagree with? I'd be happy to know. If you know someone who will enjoy this episode, I invite you to share it with them. Till next time.